Hello, Marco here. I hope you're fine. And welcome to another episode of the series about uh, creating kinematic vehicles from scratch. In this tutorial, which is going to be in two parts, so a bit longer than usual, we will answer a question which I got multiple times. Can kinematic vehicles drive on an uneven terrain? Well, the answer is yes, they can. And this is exactly what we'll build in this episode. As usual, if you don't have the time to follow the full tutorial or prefer to work with a ready-made project, you can find the link in the description below. I make it available for a small fee and it contains many announcements respect to the tutorial version, including sounds, recall animation, and dynamically placed targets you can shoot at. So without further ado, let's get started. So let's uh, start uh, a real engine 5.3 from the launcher. And we want to select games and blank. Let's call our project tank game tutorial. Create. And we are brought into the map with this uh, nice terrain already made for us. So the first thing we want to do is in the content drawer, under content, let's right click and create a new folder called tank. And we are going to import to this folder the tank resource that has been provided to you in the description. So uh, let's locate it. And then tank low poly. Click open. And what you want to do here is click skeleton mesh. So this has to be checked. The reason is that our tank is provided as a, a series of parented meshes. So we want Unreal to automatically rig it into a skeletal mesh. Therefore, we'll check the skeletal mesh flag and leave everything else as is. Click import all. And as you can see, we get our tank with blank materials, but this will change afterwards. So we can always assign new materials to it. You will also get apparently an error or a warning saying that it could not find the bind pose. This is normal because the imported file was not originally a skeletal mesh, so you can close it and totally disregard it. Okay, now in the content drawer, we have our tank with uh, uh, also a physics asset and this is the skeleton so let's open the physics asset and have a look and as you can see the tank has been automatically rigged uh, using capsules and spheres and uh, since this is a kinematic vehicle we don't need any of this we just need the collision hall for the body of the tank so Let's click on the body and by the way, we want the collision hole not to be a capsule, but to be a real convex hole. So let's right click on body and then we'll say delete. And by the way, we can select them all and delete as well. And now we have no assets anymore, but we also don't see the bones to see the bones click on uh, this little gear icon and then show all bones. By the way, you can also see the structure of the tank here. So we have the body, which is uh, the main part. And then we have the two tracks parented to it. These are the meshes for the track. This is the part of the skeletal mesh. Then we have the turret. And as you can see, the turret is parented to the body and uh, um, if we go into the skeleton and select the turret, you will see that the turret rotates as well as the barrel, which is also parented to it. So if we select the barrel, you see that the barrel can rotate up and down. And then we have all the wheels, uh, of course, and the sprockets, and uh, but will not be animating this uh, in this case because the tank will mostly be seen from the back, from the rear. Okay, so back to the physics asset, let's click on body and then using the window bottom right, we'll select single convex hull 
and then just click add body. And here we get a nice shape. So this we can use in case of collisions or in case we want to detect a hit uh, to the tank from maybe other tanks or enemies or whatever. So for the moment, uh, we leave it as it is. Uh, let's save and close. Save also the skeleton in case and close. So we are ready to uh, start coding. So let's click on content, new folder, and as usual, blueprints. Right click, blueprint class, and we want to create a pawn. Let's call it BP underscore tank. Now let's open it so we can start editing it. So the first thing is we add a skeleton mesh to it. So click on the plus add, select skeleton mesh. It comes by default parent to the full scene root, which we don't want. So you just click and drag on top of the root and the root will, the default root will disappear. And we just get the uh, skeleton mesh. By the way, we can also uh, rename this or you can leave it called uh, skeleton mesh. That's fine. And we move here on the right under details and the drop down, we select the tank low poly. Okay. So this is our tank. And this is what we will be uh, working with. Now switch into the event graph. Always good to compile from time to time. Let's start uh, by getting rid of these other nodes. We'll add them uh, back later, those that we need. And on begin play, since we will be using the enhanced input system, we'll um, configure it. So get player controller and we will be getting the player controller zero. Get announced the input local player subsystem. And from here, we want to call a node called add mapping context. Okay, this is what we need in order to implement and connect the enhanced input subsystem to uh, this phone. Okay, we don't have the mapping context yet. That's something that we need to create. Uh, so in order to create that, let's close this, go back to the content drawer uh, under content, we right click and choose new folder and we call this inputs. Now within the inputs folder, right click uh, and under input, we want to create an input action and input action are named by default IA as input action. And the first one will be uh, drive. So this is the driving backward and forward, forward and backward of the tank. As you can see inside, we don't need to change much, only the value type. We want it to be axis 1D, okay, and save. Next in the same folder, uh, right click input, uh, input action, and we want to call this IA. Turn. So this is the input action that we'll be using to turn a tank uh, left or right, also while driving. And also this has to be an axis 1D float. Okay, we're almost done, but not yet. So in the same, let's in the same folder, let's right click input and then another one, IA turret. And for the turret, we'll do something slightly different because we plan to control the rotation of the turret, but also the elevation of the barrel uh, with the mouse. So we're going to use an uh, axis 2D. And this will allow us to work with two directions at the same time. So save. And last but not least, uh, we want our tank to fire. So uh, I click input, input action. IA fire. And this one will be digital bull because the fire is uh, just pressing the key and it happens. It doesn't have any value, well, doesn't have any axis. It's just uh, on and off, true or false. Okay, save. 
And now we have everything we need to create our input mapping, mapping context. So let's create that. We call it input mapping context, IMC tank. And let's open it. And I know that this is the bit boring part of it, but we have to go through it. So let's start with the drive. So you press the plus and then select the input action that has already been created. And once you have it, you can start assigning keys to it. So for uh, driving, if you click on the little keyboard then you can press directly the key that you want to use. In this case, it's W for forward. And then plus here to add yet another key, press on the keyboard again and S for going backward. And here we need to change the modifier because uh, we want this to be negative. So we click here the plus and then we can choose negate. So this covers the drive part. Uh, we press plus again, and then we can choose the turn. And same thing, same drill, so plus to add yet another one, because we need two. Uh, we click on the keyboard here, and right will be D, and left will be A. And by the way, same thing for the left. We also need to add a modifier which is a negate. Okay, so we're good with uh, the drive and turn. So let's work on the turret. So for the turret, we'll be using uh, this action. And remember, that this is a 2D action. So what we'll do is from uh, the drop down here, choose mouse and then mouse X, Y to the axis. And in this way, we have combined the two, so we can use the mouse X axis to rotate the turret and the mouse Y axis to control the elevation of the barrel. Okay, last but not least, we need our fire button and uh, uh, let's add another one as fire. And then I think fire we can uh, you know use two keys maybe. Um, let's use the I think it's handy because we are already controlling the turret with the mouse. So when I use the uh, left mouse button, but if we want, we can add also a key. Let's say that we want to use uh, uh, maybe space as well. So I'm going to click on the keyboard and click on the space key on the keyboard. And there it is. Okay. So we seem to have all our mapping in place and we have the drive, we have the turn, we have the turret and we have the fire. Okay, now let's save this and close. And now we can go back to our tank blueprint, open it. And here in the mapping context for the node we added earlier, you can see that we can select the IMC tank. Okay, so let's compile. And now to the skeletal mesh, we want to add a spring arm because we need a camera to see what is happening to our tank and then if you click on it and add again, we can add a camera. Perfect. So let's uh, switch back to viewport. And now we see that the camera is not really well positioned with respect to the tank. We're going to basically, we'll, we'll not see much if it stays there. So one thing we want to select the spring arm and make it longer, let's say 500. That makes sense. Even a bit more, maybe it can be 600, depending on the perspective you want to have. And then we uh, stay on the spring arm, but switch to rotation. And we want to, oops, we want to rotate it a bit up, maybe 20 degrees. So it looks down on the tank. And by the way, we can already check uh, what happens in game. But first, let's click on the root of our tank and search for auto possess player and we want to auto possess with player zero so we can control it directly okay let's compile and save and as ugly as it is we can already place our tank in the level so let's maybe uh, zoom in a bit and i'm using the w on the keyboard and then holding the right mouse button until i'm getting close to the ground oops too much i can come back 
and we're gonna place our tank there. So open the content browser and drag the tank on the floor and you see that we are a bit uh, below it. So I'm gonna raise the tank and then press the end key on the keyboard, which using the collision hole we place in the physics asset is placing the tank uh, on the floor, actually a bit lower so we can raise it. And I think this is good. Okay, so we'll keep it there for the moment. And uh, if we play, we can already see what we are seeing through our camera. Perfect. So that's going to be our view on the tank. And if you don't like it, you can adjust it. Uh, that's fine. Okay, stop. And now let's see what we are about to do. So I'm bringing in a nice drawing. Basically, what we want to do is to trace down, use a line trace, that's a red one dotted line here. We want to uh, line trace down from the tank to find where the ground is. And as the tank advances, we are going to get uh, from the trace information about the normal to the ground. So this blue line, the blue arrow, that's the perpendicular to the ground in that point where the trace is hitting the ground. And we will do the same for all the traces that we are going to run. And we are planning to run four of them, but it could be also a bit more. And once we have this information from the traces, we are going to average them. So we're going to take the normals and we're going to average them because that's the average normal among all the hitting traces. And that tells us how we should rotate the tank in order to keep it coherent with the ground it is on. But that's not it because our tank can also uh, go downhill and uphill. And since we are moving it kinematically, the other thing we need to get from the traces are the heat levels. So imagine this is the Z of the word and uh, this heat point will have a Z which is lower than this other heat point. Okay, the Z will be higher because the axis goes in the vertical direction uh, up here. What we want to do is to take the Z, so the vertical level of each hit, and then average that one as well, like we do with the traces, in order to find this midpoint. And this midpoint we can use to move the tank up or down after we have rotated it using the normal, so that it stays on top of the ground and doesn't go through it and doesn't go above it. And you will see in a while how this works. Now, I hope this explanation was uh, good enough. We might take this uh, back later once we have implemented some of the code. But basically what we want to do is uh, to create a component because we want to do multiple traces and each one has to identify the normal to the ground, also has to identify the height of the hit point. So we want to efficiently do all this in a component so we can have as many traces as we need. Okay, and I plan for four, but it could also be more. So right click on the content drawer and then here, new blueprint class, and we want to create a sync component. And the reason we want the sync component is that we want a starting point for the trace and you will see in a moment how this works. So let's call this BP underscore uh, ground sensing. Okay, Maybe that's a fancy name, but this is what these traces are doing. And let's open it. Okay, so let's get rid of uh, the event begin play, which we don't need, but we'll definitely need the tick. So out of tick, we will right away do a line trace by channel. And this allows us to test the terrain using the visibility channel. Um, we need a starting point and an end point for it. So the starting point is going to be get word location. So we're basically using the word location of this component. And that's why target remains self as a starting point. And we can connect it right away. Now we need an end point. So we are basically going to uh, trace down. So what we need to get is the up vector. So get up vector which is the vertical vector of the component. And then we need to multiply this vector by a distance. Remember that uh, 
the up vector is a unit vector, so it's like this one. Uh, we cannot trace for uh, in a one centimeter. That will not be enough. So we have to trace for more. So what we'll do is create a variable which we call trace distance, and it has to be of type float. And let's call it trace distance. And we will take it, drag it on top of this yellow pin, and this will automatically change it to a double. So that's uh, um, done for you by the engine. Earlier, you know, you had to select a specific node, but now uh, a real engine five the latest versions do it for you. And uh, once we have this unit vector multiplied by the trace distance, which we have to set, by the way, so we compile, we'll have to set this one. Uh, see, before we forget, let's use, for example, 200. So that's two meters. We'll take the word location, subtract from it the trace distance, and you know, times the up vector, and this is our end location. Basically, we are starting from the word location and tracing downward, that's why we have this minus, by a distance which is equivalent to what trace distance is set to, which is 200. And we have a couple of other things to tweak. So first of all, we don't want to trace against the tank itself. So basically, we want to get the owner of this component, which is our tank, using the handy function, which is get owner, and then connect this to actors to ignore, and then automatically Aria will create uh, an array for us, because this node requires an array. Uh, it's an array with only one component, which is uh, uh, the get owner, okay? And ignore self, make sure it's checked. And by the way, if we want to see how the trace is going, we can also, for the moment, then we'll disable, do a draw debug type, uh, one frame. Okay, so we're gonna see the trace uh, as a red line um, during the gameplay. And by the way, you can select two nodes and press Q to align them if this bothers you. All right, so uh, what we want to do next is to check if we have a valid return value, because if not, we cannot work with it. So we're gonna place a branch and then connect our return value. And if we have a valid return value, we drag out of the hit pin, and then we select break hit results. In this way, we have access to what we need in order to understand what we are uh, hitting with this trace and where we are hitting. So we want to do three things now. Uh, first of all, we take the blocking it and we right click on it and we say promote to variable and we call this be on ground. And by the way, by default and by convention, not by default, but by convention, the Boolean variables in Unreal are named with a, a lowercase b at the beginning, which by the way, it disappears. So you don't see it uh, in the naming reported on the node. Uh, which is interesting. Uh, it's a feature, of course. And if we have a blocking it, uh, we're gonna get its valid to uh, the on ground variable, meaning yes, so we have we are on ground. We have hit something, and that's the ground. And the other thing that we want to track is, as we said earlier, the location of the hit. So right click and also promote it to variable, and we'll call it uh, you know hit location and we'll also assign it here and the normal so right click on the normal um, promote the variable hit normal and we'll also assign this one okay maybe let's make this prettier and I'm double clicking on a connection line to make a reroute pin and last but not least, if we don't have a, a, you know, a blocking hit for some reasons, but actually if this is not true, we want to uh, make sure that uh, we also set on ground to false on dragged it on the execution pin, which automatically turns it into a set. I'm gonna place it up here. 
and then make sure that this is false. All right, so this is uh, uh, our ground sensing component. And uh, um, again, it gets uh, us information whether we are on the ground or not. So where it's hitting uh, the ground uh, will get, uh, if there is a valid hit, the hit location and the normal, which is the vector we need to use to calculate the rotation. So let's compile and save. And now we can go back to our tank. OK, so let's close this and then back to our tank blueprint. Let's start adding our sensing components. So switch into the viewport and then click on the skeletal mesh here because we want to parent them to the skeletal mesh. Click add. And now if we search BP underscore ground sensing, we find our component. So we need uh, four of them. So I'm going to number the first one as one and then right click, duplicate, it will automatically become a two. Right click, duplicate, it will become a three and right click, duplicate, it will become four. So we have uh, four components that we need, but they're all in the same location at the moment. So let's distribute them. The best way to distribute them is actually to have a top view. So I'm going to switch to top view. And then one by one, we'll place them where we see fit. So let's see if we need to adjust a bit. So the ground sensing one, we'll place it here. And note that we are at plus 60. Then the ground sensing two, I'm going to place it on the other side. And we are also at let's see, 60. So uh, minus 80 because we want to have some symmetry and 80. So these are now symmetric. And uh, the three, we also want to put it here. And let's respect the 80 like we had on the Y. And the same for the last one. So let's go here. And I forgot that was minus 110 80. So this one has to be under than. 10, minus 110, like the other one, and minus 80, because it's on the other side. OK, let's switch back to be the right view. And you see uh, where they are placed at the moment. So they are at uh, a zero level. We can even raise them a bit uh, if need be. So we can shift to select them all. And now we can change the Z, for example, to 10. So they go a bit higher. And this gives us the chance to do the trace from um, a bit of a higher um, level. By the way, I'm noticing that uh, um, the one, I will pull it a big bit back uh, so that we are above this point, which is where the track is uh, bending up. Uh, so we are at 50. So the two, we also want it to be at 50. And now the three, I yeah, will also move it a bit forward. So we are at 100. And therefore, the four also needs to go at 100. OK, now switching back to the perspective, I think we have them properly placed. And you can see they're all around the tank. And they are tracking down from their respective locations. OK, so let's compile. And now we can go to the event graph and start taking advantage of those traces. OK, so let me close this up a bit because it's taking quite some space. And we want to add an event tick. So we had it before, but uh, we deleted it. So now we are taking it back. What we want to do is basically loop through all these components and collect their on ground state, collect whether uh, their hit point, hit location and collect their hit normal. OK, so since we want to be flexible and say that we are adding you know, more of them, we don't want to go one by one naming them. What we will do is uh, store them in an array. OK, so we'll do this on begin play because we need to do it only at the very beginning. We will use a function called get components by class. 
And this one is allowing us to look at all the components which are part of this actor and filter them by their class. And we are going to choose BP ground sensing because we want all of our ground sensing. And we can assign them to uh, an array, store them to an array. So we already have an array as a return value. So we right click, promote to variable, and we're going to call this uh, ground sensing array. I think that's fine. And we're going to connect it to uh, our add mapping context. So this all happens on uh, event begin play. Okay, so now let's move down to our event tick and let's start working with it. First thing we need to do is take our uh, ground sensing array and we want to do a for each loop. So we are looping through all these, um, through all the, through all the uh, ground sensing components. And what we want to do is, uh, you know, get their values and average them. Now, in order to do that, uh, before we can divide by the number of components, which we know because that's the size of the array, we need to sum them up. Uh, so basically, let's, uh, uh, you know, get uh, a variable for that. Uh, actually, we need a few. So first of all, we want uh, an average normal. So let's create a vector variable, rename, average, normal. And what we're going to do is take the average normal and do a plus, add, and actually we can, we control move this line uh, to the bottom pin. Out of the array element, we can do a get hit normal. Okay. So now we have access to the hit normal coming from uh, that component. We could do it more elegantly and maybe create a gather function, but uh, let's do it this way. And then we add it to the average normal. So now as we loop through, we'll keep adding to that. And then as we do the completed and we get out of the loop, uh, we will uh, divide it by the number of components that we have the real average. Okay. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is, okay, now we have to reassign it to itself. So that's basically the rolling sum of this. Second, we also get the uh, impact location, the hit location, sorry. But from the hit location, we are not interested in, you know, all the dimensions of the vector, we are only interested in the Z. So what we're going to do is uh, right click, split pin struct, and this heat location, uh, we want to assign it also to uh, an average. So let's create a new uh, float variable, which we call it uh, average height because this is the Z coordinate and uh, same drill. So we'll take this, get, we'll sum it to uh, the output of, uh, so the Z of the hit location, and then we'll assign it to itself. So we have a rolling sum and later on, we're gonna divide it. Okay, so we have this uh, average height now, the other thing that we want to do is um, some of these ground sensing components will uh, might be off the ground, so we don't get any touch. Say that you are on edge or, okay, some of those components will not detect the ground, so basically their own ground is false. So we want to count only those um, that uh, uh, are actually hitting the ground because we are not interested in the normal of the others or the height of the others, you know, that might be either zero or spurious or, you know, not interesting. What is interesting is if we get the me on ground, actually on ground, so get on ground. And if, and only if this on ground is 
through, uh, we will add a counter, we'll add one to a counter, which counts how many of this uh, sensing arrays or uh, sensing components are actually sensing the ground. Okay. So we need to create a variable for ourselves called um, count on ground. Sounds like a fair name. Uh, it can be integer. I mean, that's uh, fine. And that, that's enough. And then if and only if this on ground uh, is true, we will increment that counter. And the way to do it is we can drag this, do a get, and then use a handy plus plus, so the increment int, and this will increment the int, okay? And of course, we have to make sure that this is not uh, zero, you know, we can count it later. Uh, we can also leave with the error. Last thing for this cycle is the following for this loop. Uh, every time we get into the loop, which is once per tick, uh, we want to start with zero as average normal, zero as average height, and also zero as our counter, because every time we have to repeat fetching through the components and updating uh, the results. And by the way, I'm going to do a queue here so that this is a straight line. So what we need to do is, before we enter this loop, we need to zero this value, right? And so we have the, the freshest calculations. Now, one way to do it is actually to uh, maybe use a sequence if we want to, or actually we can also, you know, scroll this, uh, sorry, slide them a bit to the right and add here our zeroing of the variable. So we want to zero the average normal. So we start with a zero vector, the average height, also, we start at zero, and also our count has to be zero, okay? Every tick with zero, and we loop through components, we calculate the rolling sums, and then we update the counter. And with that information, we are able now to tackle the completed uh, part of the loop. And what we want to do is the following, okay? So we go here. And we take our, um, we set our average, if I spell it correctly, it will pop up, pop up, set average normal to the rolling sum divided by the um, number of components that have uh, hit the ground. Okay, so we're going to take again the average normal divided by the count on ground. And basically this is our average normal, the real average normal. This one, you know, we uh, use the variable to uh, keep the hold the rolling sum, but this is now the real normal because we have divided by number of um, hits. Now we do the same with the uh, average height, but with a variation which I'll Describe in a moment. So let's take uh, our average height and we assign it here to average height as before divided by uh, the count on ground. Okay. And now we have the real average height. But remember that this height is actually at ground level. And we want to use this to position our tank above the ground, which basically means we need to add the height offset to it because our tank actually has to be higher than the ground. If we use this as such, we'll place it uh, on the ground, basically. We don't want that. So we take this value and we add it to a new variable, which we are going to create. Uh, right click uh, on the second pin of the plus and then promote the variable. And we'll call it height offset. So basically this tells us uh, how much we need to raise from that point in order to find the location where we have to position our tank. And with that, we can calculate uh, the delta. So if the tank is uh, you know, right now at 100, but we need to put it to 110, 
we need to get its location uh, at the Z of its location. So we do a get actor location. We right click and split the struct pin because we only need the Z. And we're going to take the soap position of uh, uh, tank. So where it should be, we take it, we take where it is right now, which is given by the get actor location. And we finally have our delta z, which we're going to use in a moment. So right click here. We don't have a variable for this. So promote the variable. Let's call it delta z. And remember to assign it. Okay. At this point, we have uh, you know, all the calculations that we need uh, in order to set the new rotation and also the new location of the tank. So let's compile. So let's tackle the rotation first. What we're going to do is take our average normal, which we have just calculated. And then we're going to take, actually, let me put it down here and zoom in a bit. So we see uh, we take the get actor right vector. OK, so we have the average normal, which is pointing up. We have the right vector of the actor, which is pointing right. And we are using these two to create a rotator. And since we have two axes, so we have the up axis, which is defined by the normal, and we have the right axis, which is defined by the get, uh, right vector of the actor, the forward axis is determined as a consequence because they have to be uh, orthogonal, right? So we, they have to be uh, 90 degree angles from each one which basically means we can use this function, which is called make rot. And mind the fact that the sequence is important, make rot from Z, Y. Okay, so Y is our right vector and Z is our normal. So we give priority to the normal. Then we feed in the right vector and the forward vector will come as a consequence. Okay, very important. Do not mix them up. And uh, this one we can directly feed into a set actor rotation and we're going to make some adjustments shortly but for the moment let's do that so out of here we say set actor rotation i don't want to complicate things right away so i'm going to take it step by step let's feed in here and this is taking care of the rotation believe it or not uh, very simple. We'll check in a moment how it works. Uh, but next, we have to uh, you know, take care of the location because this sets the rotation. But how about the location? We need to use our delta z. Okay. So how we're going to use our delta z is, uh, uh, well, eventually everything will fit into an add actor word offset. And why we're using, uh, you know, add? because basically we want to move it up or down depending if the delta z is positive or negative, right? So we don't want to set a total new location altogether like we are doing with the rotation. We are setting a total new rotation. But for the location, uh, we want to act on the location we already have and just add or subtract vertically from it uh, depending on uh, the value of delta z. Now, this is also used, and this can be used and should be used uh, to move the tank forward or backward. And uh, uh, in order to do that, uh, we need to define uh, somehow a speed for it, and we need to link it later to the inputs. Okay. So now it gets a tad complicated, so uh, you know, bear with me. And uh, we will use also a bit of interpolation because we want the movement to be uh, gradual. OK, so we're going to define a new variable and we are going to call it current forward speed. And this variable has to be a type float. OK. We're going to right click and duplicate it because we need yet another one. And this is target forward speed. If you have watched uh, my previous tutorials, you would recognize how we're going to use those. 
and we are going to right click and call a finterp to node okay we are going to take the current forward speed and of course uh, plug it into the current pin of the node and the target forward speed and plug it into the target pin we need a delta time and typically this uh, word delta seconds so if you type word you will get, get word delta seconds this is a tick time uh, which by the way we could also get from event tick up here but it's kind of too far so uh, let's do that and uh, as an interpolation speed let's put a two and you know, we can change this and play a bit with it and see how it behaves now this movement has to be in the forward direction of the actor right so we need to get actor forward vector and we need to multiply the two and since, it, since this is the interpolated speed uh, what we need to do is also uh, if we want we have speed and we want displacement we have to multiply it by delta time as well so we already have the node here we just drag it uh, by after having added a new pin and basically we have the forward part of the movement okay but we have not taken into account the delta z yet and the delta z has to act along the vertical axis so here we have the forward axis so let's take uh, get actor up vector so that's the vertical axis of the actor and as before we multiply it by delta z Okay, and this is already the um, displacement. So here we have speed times delta time. We have the displacement, and this is directly displacement because we calculated from the positions. Now these two movements, so the forward one and the vertical one, we're going to sum them together so they become one unique movement, and that's the one we're going to feed into at actor word offset. Okay. This is basically how we're going to handle the vertical movement and this is how we're going to handle the rotation. Okay, We're not done yet because we want to handle the rotation also with some interpolation and don't forget, let's compile, that we have not taken into account the turning. So there is, uh, uh, you know, if this is the target forward speed which comes from the player um, we don't have any target rotation which comes from the player so right now our set actor rotation is not taking into account the turning command from the player we'll do it in a sec after we have tested how this works so right now if we you know compile and save and close and then click play you will see that we have a problem we seem to be <laughs> into the ground and uh, if you remember uh, let's reopen our blueprint blueprint we had a value up here which is called height offset and this one is still set to zero so basically this places the tank with its center point with its pivot point flush to the ground which is not what we want of course so let's see uh, what it should be. I mean, we can also measure it from, uh, you know, the tank mesh, but let's try out the moment. Let's give it a 60, for example, and then play. Okay, that's better. And if we want to see where we stand, we can press F8 to eject ourselves. So now we have unpossessed the tank and we can look at it. And yeah, it's pretty good. We are kind of flush to the ground, so 60. Uh, looks like a good value okay perfect now the other thing that we can do is uh, um, going back here and by the way in this part of the code uh, after we have updated you know the the finterp and used it we also need to update the current forward speed okay so that's very important if we forget that the finterp is not going to work correctly so 
I'm going to drag uh, that uh, current forward speed. And now we take the output of the fin turb and we reassign it to it so that we can keep track of it for the next tick. That's very important. So uh, we have a bit of maybe this one we place it up here. Yeah, looks a bit better. Good. Um, and what we can do to test how our tank is going is to uh, artificially set the target forward speed. Okay. So let's take this, uh, and normally this will be set by the user input, but uh, let's set, for example, uh, 300. So that's uh, three meters per second. Compile and save. And now let's play, and we should see our tank advancing, which is what it's doing. And, uh, uh, well, the ground is flat here, so we cannot really tell whether it's sensing the ground as it should, but what we can do is, uh, because this is a landscape, so basically we can go to the editor, switch to landscape modeling, which is this one here, and then, you know, take the sculpt, uh, and maybe, as you can see, you know, we can see we are increasing, we are modeling the landscape to increase the uh, it's slope and we have created a little hill here, which we can use to test our logic. So let me switch back to selection. Let's uh, go to our tank and check. Okay, now it's slightly in the ground, so we're going to pull it back. And uh, by the way, we can also use the simulate, right? So we don't have to eject. So we can just simulate and then follow it and see whether it's sensing the ground. Well, it is. And let's follow it and see if it can also go up downhill. And yes, it can. Cool. So this seems to work uh, very well, provided that we don't have uh, you know any sharp edge. And by the way, we can test it later also with a sharp edge. But now we also created for ourselves a nice little hill which can be used uh, to test uh, how uh, this is working, okay? So the next thing that we want to do is, uh, by the way, this map needs to be saved. Uh, so let's take the chance to do it now. Um, we should click a save all on the content drawer. By the way, we have a lot to save. Uh, but we'll also ask us, okay, where do we want to save this map? So uh, content, right click, new folder, maps. And then we're going to call this uh, test map, assuming you, know, you will want to create your own map at a certain point. And I think we need also to do a build all at this point. Yes, build the actual these, save everything. And this concludes part one of the tutorial. So I'll see you back in part two.